and noticing your plant doesn't look quite right? Hopefully this Debaco University video can provide you a great visual guide to foliar symptoms of nutrient deficiencies in cannabis plants to help you identify the issue that might be going on. All right, let's get into the visual guide here, foliar symptoms and help provide you a diagnosis as well as a potential way to correct the issue. So first off, some of these images are based off the uh, research article here. If you wanna get into the research article in more detail, I provide the citation here so you can do so. Now just some general reminders is that nutrient mobility in the plant for mobile nutrients, they move to new growth areas. That means deficiency symptoms will first be seen in older leaves. In comparison to immobile nutrients that don't move to new growth, these deficiencies will be first seen in the newer growth regions of the plant. We're talking about classifying nutrients. Our primary nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and they contribute to plant nutrient content, uh, function of plant enzymes, and biochemical processes and integrity of plant cells. Your secondary nutrients are your calcium, your magnesium, and your sulfur, and these are needed in smaller amounts uh, than the primary nutrients, leading us finally to micronutrients, which are necessary for plant survival, but are needed in very small micro quantities. For when we look about fertilizers, um, chelated or chelated fertilizers are preferred since it will enhance nutrient uptake and improve efficiency and utilization, and the goal is plant available nutrients, and some of them also and better applied foliarly. So keep in mind, if you can find a chelated form of a nutrient, that is definitely the way to go. Now nutrient classifications, just providing you at this table here, when we look at our nutrients, whether it's a macro or a micro, the uptake form and chemical form and ions, it's mobility in the plant and the soil. A lot of people forget, we're gonna focus of course on the plant mobility, but soil mobility can also play a factor into your um, odds that you see a deficiency or ways about going correcting it. So first off, looking at the study, we gotta start with the control plant where there's no nutrient deficiencies. Uh, looking A here is week five, week six, week seven, and then week eight. While in week eight, fan leaves developed increasing levels of foliar chlorosis, we can see that here and here, um, this is considered the control plant. So we're really looking at the inflorescence of the flowers, the fan leaves, yes, we wanna see them good, but here to the end, you're in good shape. And as a last reminder, we are looking at a plant, so there will be some variables. We can see here with the sunflowers, there's gonna be some variability plant to plant. So I'm gonna to try to show you the major or the textbook images, if you will, that you should use for comparison. So let's start with a nitrogen um, deficiency. So looking at here, A, we're looking at uh, week three, lower canopy foliar issue, um, nitrogen deficiency, uh, plants starting to yellow. That might be a little hard to see, but we're having a lightening of that green. And this will typically start in the lower leaves. Uh, we look at uh, week four, um, looking at week four, the progression of nitrogen deficiency symptoms of the fan leaves from mild, uh, which is on the right, to the most severe, which is of course here on the left. Looking at C here, the whole leaf chlorosis developing and fan leaves of the lower two thirds of the plant canopy. And then for week five, almost the entire senescence of fan leaves, stem browning, yellowing, and beginning of sugar leaf chlorosis in nitrogen deficient plants. So a really advanced form of yellowing. So keep in mind, it might be a little hard to see here, but that lightening, that green, and different varieties will have different deepness to their green coloration. So you wanna be aware of that. Now we go about correcting a nitrogen deficiency, and I'll do this for all the nutrients. Remember, it is a primary mobile nutrient. Use 100 to 120 parts per million of nitrogen fertilizer as the target concentration. I have other videos that go about how to calculate that. Your nitrates versus your nitrates. Remember, nitrates dissolve in water and therefore move about the soil with uh, the movement of soil water. The nitrites are not uh, stable, intermediate, and this is not able to be used by the plant. We can see that right here. Ammonia can be taken up by the plant, and nitrates can be moved, but nitrites cannot. We're also looking at ammonium, uh, ammonia versus ammonium. Ammoni ammonia um, has the highest nitrogen content of any commercial fertilizer, about 82% nitrogen. However, it is delivered as a gas. It needs to be injected about four to eight inches, 10 to 20 centimeters below the surface. Um, here, it will react with soil water to form ammonium, which can be utilized by the plants. Uh, for other growers, calcium nitrate is, recom is recommended. There's blood meal, there's uh, bat guano, and there's ureas. Uh, there are also um, options, but with ureas like nitrates, urea needs to dissolve in and move through water soil and can be lost through leaching if not converted to ammonia and then ammonium. 
This conversion of uh, ammonia takes about two to four days when soil moisture and temperature are favorable for plant growth. Lower temperatures slow the process, which will continue down even to freezing because they need the microbes to be able to work that. So typically in outdoor applications, urea is recommended in those summer or warmer months. Um, calcium nitrate when it's cooler out. Calcium nitrate can be used throughout the entire um, season. Same with blood meal and black guano. As uh, so just a last reminder with nitrogen, it happens quick. So favor on the lower side, because you can always add more, it's hard to take away. Now looking at phosphorus uh, deficiency here, brown spots on fan and sugar leaves. Uh, looking here, a week three, progression of foliar phosphorus deficiency symptoms in the fan leaves. And then we can kind of see that progression here um, for week four. And then we have week five driven by um, C as well as D, which is right below me. Uh, in E, we see the whole plant phosphorus deficiency symptoms. Sugar leaves associated with the apical infl inflorescence are shown in the insert. Now, I will say overall, I don't see a lot of this. Um, so really scrutinize um, these images to see if this is actually a phosphorus deficiency you have going on. Because, of course, there's other pathogens or other issues uh, that could be occurring. So really scrutinize these images and see if that's really a good match for what you're seeing in your plant. Now, how do you deal with the phosphorus uh, deficiency? How do you correct that? It is a primary mobile nutrient in the plant. It's generally immobile in the soil. So that's what we have to keep in mind, our soil versus our plant comparisons. Phosphates versus phosphites. So phosphates are essential for plant growth. Phosphites are not essential nutrients. Use more as a fungicide to induce the systemic acquired resistance, or SAR, in plants and not a fertilizer. Not a common deficiency seen in plants though. Most growers over fertilize with phosphorus, to be honest, especially when it gets to the flowering stage and I have other videos showing you don't need as much phosphorus as many growers typically are adding. Reasons for not over fertilizing are to keep other nutrients in balance and to maximize your yields, to save money and limit potential groundwater contamination. Now, potassium deficiency, we're seeing the pro progression of that. We see that in the um, sugar leaves at week four and the fan leaves at week four. And then we see the middle part of the canopy really showing the most severe portions. Now, typically it is located a little bit more on the margins of the leaves or the edges of the leaves and located a little bit more on the ends of the leaves, so a little bit more on the end portions and then the margins within those. So good indications or areas to look if you're suspecting a potassium deficiency. Now, how do you correct a potassium deficiency? It is a primary mobile nutrient. Potassium sulfate would be recommended. You could use potassium uh, chloride or murate of potassium. It does have more potassium, 60% versus only 50, but there are more salt associated with it, so it is used more in outdoor applications where there might be more natural rain to flush through that. Or just looking at large trucks trying to carry a higher concentration of potassium fertilizer. Some growers recommend wood ash. Um, you can use it, but be careful because it will um, raise your pH, so use it sparingly because it will bring your pH up dramatically on there. Then it brings us to a calcium deficiency. So progression of calcium deficiency starting in the lower uh, fan leaves here in week three. And then we see a more severe um, progression, uh, pro progress I should say, here going from a normal to kind of more advanced uh, symptoms. Looking at letter C, week five is general leaf, leaf margin necrosis on lower fan leaves. And then we've got upper fan and sugar leaves starting to show symptoms as well at week five. And then right next to me over here, week six, the majority of fan leaves and sugar leaves show that characteristic leaf margin necrosis and upper leaves are curled uh, upwards. So again, key distincting factors here. So don't just jump to one, look at them all and really see what signs you're seeing in your leaves and what do they actually match up with. And hopefully you're catching it in the earlier phases rather than later ones. Now, how do you correct a calcium deficiency? It's a secondary immobile nutrient. If you add lime, there is calcium in that product, but not as much of that as plant available. So keep that in mind. A CalMag from Botanicare, I recommend that one. And Biomin Cal, I've used them both. I have uh, tissue tests that show CalMag Plus from Botanicare does raise levels. So follow manufacturer recommendations um, and keep that feed going. And hopefully you'll see a slowdown and then prevention of that deficiency symptoms from there progressing. Magnesium deficiency is represented by intervenal chlorosis or yellowing. Uh, here we see uh, week four is when it's first starting to appear. Might be a little hard to see, but it's first starting to appear here, and that's through intervenal uh, chlorotic regions. The chlorosis is moving towards the uh, necrotic areas in between the leaflet, midrib, and the margins. We kind of see that where the veins stay really dark green, and it's those in-between areas where you're first seeing it. 
Here we see more advanced week five. The most of the smaller fan leaves started to show symptoms. And then week six, the magnesium deficiency was widespread across the entire plant, except for some older and larger fan leaves. So it can be a little spotty. Keep that in mind. How do you correct a magnesium uh, deficiency? Well, it's a secondary mobile nutrient. CalMag has some magnesium in it, but Epsom salts has a higher concentration of magnesium if you're really targeting that. One tablespoon per gallon um, for early onset and foliar applications would be recommended for Epsom salts. A substrate drench and a foliar application would be recommended to try to ensure that that magnesium is going to meet both ways and reduce the duration that your plant remains magnesium deficient. Two tablespoons per gallon or two tablespoons uh, per 3.7 liters for a quick uh, progressing issue and something you want to kind of really suppress as quickly as possible. This substrate is a drench rate because if you apply that to the leaves, you risk the chance of them damaging. It is a high concentration rate. Um, it's only recommended in most severe cases um, there, but it has been used and there is a chance of burn, uh, but don't go any higher than that would be my recommendation. Now, manganese is different than magnesium. It's basically lacking a flower size. So I know as soon as I say that, most growers are going to think, oh, I have a manganese deficiency. Um, not necessarily the case. We can see the manganese deficient versus the control for that comparison at week seven. This is the um, treatment or the manganese deficient, and that's the control. So you can see it is a slight decrease in size, and only really with a good comparison can you really tell the difference between those two images. Now, how do you go about correcting a manganese uh, deficiency? You can use manganese sulfate, often branded as palm tree fertilizer, as we can see right here. I also personally recommend Age Old Grow, again, not sponsored by them, but while the label states it only has 0.05%, um, remember these are guaranteed minimums. And based on tissue tests, uh, the likely actual concentration is quite high because I've fed um, age old grow and I've seen manganese increase in tissue test levels and it shouldn't at 0.05%. These are guaranteed minimums. So more likely than not, this contains a little bit more than that and can be used to correct manganese and also a good general fertilizer uh, just for general feeding. Leading us to a sulfur deficiency, this is um, yellowing of the sugar leaves, and this first appears as yellowing in the younger sugar leaves, and then progresses upwards and angled upward in canopy fan leaves. We can kind of see that here where they're starting to kind of go from this to a little bit more of that upward angle. The following week, symptoms did not progress in the sugar leaves, rather they progressed in the fan leaves, as we can see that kind of here, as intervenal chlorosis, not to be confused with a magnesium deficiency. The most severe and lower canopy fan leaves um, here, so keep that in mind, and look at the distinctive yellowing. It's a very bright yellow um, coloration, so keep that in mind, but it will be first seen in those upper um, sugar leaves. So timing is important in catching these early, as any grower should be in, uh, scouting their plants on a regular basis. Now, how do you go about correcting a sulfur uh, deficiency? Remember, it's in a secondary immobile nutrient. Adding elemental sulfur uh, or sulfuric acid or battery acid will add sulfur, but it'll also drive your pH down dramatically. So these are not recommended. Potassium sulfate, if you need potassium, it also contains um, um, some sulfur with it. You could also add gypsum, which will not alter your pH. There's also other sources um, of sulfur, so you might want to look at those. Some also give you the benefits of other nutrients, um, such as calcium or nitrogen. So take those into consideration, and hopefully you're identifying this potential issue early. Iron deficiency, so a progression to various uh, disparate symptoms here of iron deficiency on the upper and lower canopy tissue throughout the trial. The mild chlorosis on recently developed sugar leaves, um, we can see here. Week five, we start to see modeling and chlorosis in the central areas of those sugar leaves, located right there. And see, this uh, disappeared in later weeks. So catching it early and then seeing it shift was interesting. Week six, though, the edge necrosis of the lower fan leaves was evident, and that is key for an iron deficiency. Now, how do you go about correcting an iron deficiency? Well, it's a micro immobile nutrient, so you don't need much of it. Remember, it's a micro. Plant available forms are important as adding iron nails or iron filings will increase iron, but not necessarily plant available forms. That's where those chelated forms can be important for this nutrient. So if you can see that on the label, um, that's great. Uh, Biomin iron is another um, uh, plant available form. It uses an amino acid to help make that plant available. And you can use ferrous iron sulfate, but in this case, remember this is um, highly acidified. It's a pH of two. So growers need to make corrections to ensure that that ferrous uh, sulfate solution is actually plant available and not doing more harm than good. 
Now on my last slide here, I just want to provide you with general deficiency symptoms. So you can kind of refer to this and see sulfur and calcium and nitrogen and magnesium and phosphorus to best match up potentially what you're seeing. Now keep in mind those calcium and those phosphorus can look very close. I tend to see more calcium deficiencies than phosphorus, but utilize this guide here to visually diagnose your plants as well to hopefully provide you suggestions for fertilization to reduce the symptoms and to prevent it in the future.